Uh, I think the whole genome association business needs a whole lot more epidemiology population genomics input. So I'd like to maybe illustrate some of those uh, opportunities for you. Um, I want to talk about the, the causes of, uh, of heterogeneity of results of gene association studies. This, uh, we've raised this issue a couple of times. Uh, review the types and sources of bias. This will be a review for you, but, but particularly relate them to genomic research. Look at ex examples from our genome-wide association studies to illustrate some of these bias, or perhaps the potential of the bias, really where the defects in the literature are. Um, and identify uh, uh, strategies to um, study design, data collection, statistical analysis, um, and interpretation that could prevent or minimize bias. Now, um, rather than showing the um, bummer of, a, of a, uh, a birthmark slide again, the, the target audience of this is that there's at least one editor in the room. Um, and <laughs> And some of this, um, I think, uh, and I would say that your particular journal is not at fault here. <laughs> oh, we've got everybody pointing fingers. It's a good sign, Terry. Uh, the, um, the, the, the point here is, is that some of this has to do with editorial review, peer review of manuscripts, and then the editorial review of that is also part of the business here in terms of accepting um, uh, papers. Now, if, as you come from outside into this genome association field, you're kind of struck by kind of a land rush kind of thing. Everyone wants to be the first fly on the beached whale claiming dibs. Uh, a lot of uh, interest in, in getting there, making the first discovery, and then going on um, rather than kind of cleaning up the rest of the uh, of the field uh, and, and understanding the, the biology and, and epidemiology involved. Well, this has some uh, shortcomings if, uh, if things aren't always reproducible. Uh, this is John Unitas's, um, uh, uh, he's actually published several of these papers, but uh, this is perhaps one of the more inflammatory ones, why most published research findings are false. Um, this obviously hits um, small interest groups like the U.S. Congress. Um, and other um, uh, funding agencies, including the U.S. public, uh, and obviously um, creates a lot of issues for us in epidemiology and people are doing um, uh, observational studies. Um, and our media colleagues uh, don't help much. Uh, here's the science writer for the Wall Street Journal. Most science studies appear to be tainted by sloppy analysis. So this really is our reputation, and, and those of us, particularly in epidemiology, probably are the the um, keeper of the kingdom of proper analytic techniques relative to population-wide data. So this really is our business uh, to really understand the biases and uh, when it, they occur, obviously uh, fix them and if, when in the planning stage, perhaps prevent them. Uh, and this, I believe uh, both of those um, papers were, were based to some extent uh, on uh, this Hirschhorn paper that um, the, the study um, that uh, Terry has shown before, but really out of um, uh, out of 600 uh, uh, gene disease association, um, uh, only uh, greater than 75 of the, only six of the 101 percent showed in greater than 75 percent of the studies uh, uh, there to be uh, this uh, ability to. Um, uh, be replicated in more than 75 percent of the studies. So most of the studies come up with a lot of, uh, of issues, a lot of inconsistencies, and some, some are just downright non-reproducible. So uh, this obviously um, is a challenge to us, and so we should try to understand within the genome association studies what could be some of the explanations. Well, obviously in epidemiology, one of the first things you say was that, that there really could be the truth. It, it could be really the biologic situation. Genetic heterogeneity, uh, Terry's just told us about some gene-gene uh, interactions. Uh, for example, that uh, APOE4 gene, if you, were, um, if you were to have a high prevalence of that interacting gene versus a low prevalence of that interacting gene, you would likely uh, to find a, uh, a heterogeneity there. And of course, then the gene-environment interaction. So some of this could be true. And so we shouldn't just uh, toss out the whole thing, but, but, but say that, um, that this is also our job to sort these out. But the others, there could be spurious uh, mechanisms as well. Um, 
Um, Terry's just given you a, a lecture on, the, on uh, genomic analysis quality. Uh, and we shouldn't just, as we don't accept anything, just take everything at face value, but look at the quality of the, um, um, of the uh, genome analysis. Uh, type 1 error, obviously, is an enormous uh, issue as we come up with essentially a million chi-squares in some of these new chips. Obviously, there's going to be type 1 error, um, uh, a, a huge opportunity for type 1 error. Uh, the limited sample sizes and power, obviously, in all of our studies. Uh, there's a variety of uh, cohort age period effects. And then I'm going to talk about bias. Well, you're all familiar with, uh, with the definition of biases. Here's one from David Sackett and one from Leon Gordis. And um, uh, obviously, the, the, um, the two parts of this is that they can really occur at any stage of inference, uh, design, conduct, and analysis. Um, and they produce results or conclusions um, which differ systematically from the truth, give us uh, estimate, uh, mistaken estimates uh, uh, of the exposure's effects on not only disease but also on risk. So um, those are some biases. And just to point out that some of the effects of those biases in the genome-wide association context could be false negatives. Uh, a study which uh, includes um, people with a, a gene uh, that could be important, which um, is not identified. It could be false positives, which of course is this, uh, this type 1 error effect, uh, and we've already seen some examples. And I think this is where a lot of the discussion was. I think there's been less discussion on inaccurate effect sizes, in other words, uh, rather than uh, a, um, an odds ratio of a size or, or perhaps across many genes, a number of odds ratios, which would uh, account for um, a substantial amount of the heritability, um, you would have, uh, say, uh, some of the biases diluting the, uh, the odds ratios toward the null uh, and, um, and perhaps underestimating them, although the possibility is also for overestimates. So, so these are the usual effects of, of bias. And just to point out, there is a problem with false, um, uh, with, uh, with uh, false positives. Uh, here's a, um, a little slide on false positive human beings. Uh, here is uh, here is your ship uh, loaded with mannequins, falling into the and the sharks are saying, "What is this? Some kind of a cruel hoax?" The, the point here is is that a false positive doesn't just go into the literature and kind of disappear, but obviously then stimulates a number of confirmatory studies whose resources could otherwise have gone on to test other, perhaps more important hypotheses. So this is not just uh, if you have a, a false positive, it obviously sets up a chain of, of inquiry that, um, that does uh, use resources. So this is obviously something we need us and our students to be uh, very aware of and concerned about. So just like everything else, the types of biases in genome association studies include the selection of cases and controls. These are epidemiology studies in the, uh, in the, um, in the end analysis. Uh, obviously, information on genotype or phenotype, um, as um, Terry has already alluded to, oftentimes uh, there are more issues on the phenotype side of it than with our current genotyping. Uh, there's the analysis and presentation of results and then finally the interpretation of results uh, as uh, issues. So uh, if you look at all the kinds of, of biases, uh, and uh, as I'll mention, I'm doing a systematic review of this, I think there's a, at least 20 kinds, there's probably many more, um, but there's at least 20 kinds of biases potentially encountered in uh, genome-wide association studies. Um, and I haven't listed here the, the ones common to all human observational studies, um, response bias, et cetera, although we will discuss them uh, later. But there really are a number that are, are unique or particularly especially common in genome-wide association studies that I wanted you just to familiarize you with. Um, there's some that we call the super case or super control biases um, that we'll mention. Uh, there's this latent case bias. Uh, population stratification has already been discussed. discussed. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. The Heidring-Weinberg disequilibrium, which um, oftentimes uh, talks about uh, uh, genome quality, also genome uh, quality bias in general, um, 
affecting um, the transmission dis disequilibrium test. Uh, and I am going to talk a little bit about the winner's curse. So um, what, um, uh, in terms of my um, uh, getting into this uh, field and understanding it, um, uh, Terry and I decided that um, a systematic review of um, the genome-wide association literature um, uh, uh, now listed in the, uh, the catalog of GWAS um, would be a good thing to do, particularly looking at uh, in a kind of the epidemiology of, of bias, if you will, um, the, uh, the first 109 studies, so these go from March 2005 to uh, March 2008. I had to stop somewhere. It's just like where to stop the tide from coming in because uh, these are coming in literally every day. So we cut this, and, and um, all of those that appear in this catalog from these dates uh, are, are in there, so we believe we uh, have a, um, a, a complete sample of the literature. Um, these, this catalog only included those with genotyping platforms with density greater than 100,000 SNPs, so there may be some other smaller studies that you're aware of that aren't in there, um, and, um, but this was a, uh, an entry criteria. We looked at each study for uh, study design, description of case and comparison groups, collection of genotype and other risk factor data, particularly interested in how results were presented and how they were interpreted. Um, and um, I'm going to share some of those um, uh, preliminary results of, of this systematic review with you here. So when you're looking at the whole possibility of bias, um, uh, obviously within the whole genome-wide association literature, there's quite a heterogeneity of, of variables and diseases and, uh, and study designs. Um, uh, in terms of the phenotypes, there were discrete outcomes or traits. Uh, there were about 91 of them in 83 studies. Um, this is because uh, a number of, um, of studies had um, uh, measured a, a multiple uh, phenotypes and traits, the Framingham study, uh, the Wellcome Trust study, for example. Uh, and about um, 26 studies looked at 40 uh, quantitative traits. So this is really the uh, what we're talking about again, quite a number of different um, uh, different endpoints. But uh, one of the key points here is is that when looking at bias, of course, the study design, which is most prone to some biases of uh, of um, of case and control selection um, and uh, the, uh, collection of data um, um, information data, uh, are the case control studies, and over seventy percent of the current literature in genome-wide association studies are of that study design. Um, uh, there are uh, about 4% uh, are trios. Um, interestingly, only about 4% are nested case controls. We would expect that to uh, change as the genetic data are collected, the cohorts are followed forward, and this, uh, this type of study design is going to be used a great deal more. Uh, and then there is a number of cross-sectional, I call them cohort, they're basically the baseline studies uh, of, of cohorts which are forming uh, and cross-sectional analyses uh, were done, particularly of quantitative traits, looking at the genes and the lipid values or the genes and the, um, and the um, height, et cetera, as, uh, as cohorts um, are being formed. But the point is, is that uh, the fact that over 70 percent of these our case control studies obviously does put your uh, antennae up about uh, that this could in fact have some issues with bias. So um, as you know, um, the, the requirements for a bias-free case control study uh, in, include uh, minimization of selection bias and information bias. Uh, there should be cases, uh, should be representative of all those um, who develop the disease being studied. Uh, the controls are representative of all those at risk for developing the disease. I'm going to get back to that in a minute, and eligible to become cases um, um, and be included in the study. And then there's this other one for GWAS, ancestral geographic origins and predominant environmental exposures of cases do not differ dramatically from controls, and this is, of course, the whole population stratification issue. Uh, and then for information bias, the collection of risk factor and exposure information is same for cases and controls. So this is kind of your basic epidemiology, but just to remind you of that, because these are some of the issues that may or may not have been handled carefully uh, in some of the genome-wide association studies. 
So what uh, we did was set down some criteria for classifying whether or not these biases occurred or could occur. One of the problems was is that the data simply weren't presented. And so one couldn't, as a reader, judge whether this bias occurred or not. In, in our typical epidemiology papers, we're used to seeing the tables and the, and the analyses and things going along. And I will tell you that this body of literature departs from those uh, standard uh, forms substantially. And so we, what we try to do is capture this by, for example, for misclassification bias, it would be really the absence of description or the use of adequate means to define cases of controls. For example, as Terry said, the description of the controls as being Belgian probably isn't enough for me as an epidemiologist. I'd like to know a little bit more. Were they normal Belgians or northern Belgians or southern Belgians or, or whatever? Um, for non-response bias would be the absence of description of rates of recruitment participation cases controls. The prevalence incidence bias, many of these series come from clinical case sets. So obviously these use prevalent cases. Um, uh, and for, of course, if these uh, diseases are studied having uh, sizable short-term case fatality rates or remission rates, obviously that's a, a setup for prevalence incidence bias that we see in our case control studies. Obviously there's a problem with misclassification. Now calm down there, ma'am. Your cat's going to be fine, just fine. Obviously, the misclassification of this dog um, as a pet owner has its ramifications. Um, the ramifications of, um, of uh, case and controls uh, are all uh, an, also an issue. So uh, the methods of selection and recruitment um, uh, were, are, described, uh, are frequently described in a supplement or other publication. So you, you have your paper, you get it on PubMed, you're reading along, and there are no descriptions of cases and controls. And frequently those are in um, a, uh, another place, in a supplement, not published with that. You have to go look it up. I find this a real pain. Um, because I would expect there to be really my ability to judge as I go along and read the rest of that paper whether or not there are some real issues that I need to, to, to look for. So about three out of ten of these really didn't have the the methods of recruitment and selection of these um, of these um, these case and control populations. Now there are a few baseline descriptors of cases and, and of cases and controls. Only about a third had tables comparing cases and controls. And I will tell you that I was incredibly liberal about any old kind of like men and women, age. They got a they got a yes. Now I also talked about partial and full kinds of tables. Uh, I would say the number of tables which I would say would be adequate in terms of seeing a, a study of coronary disease, which was describing blood pressure and smoking and diabetes, et cetera, um, those are probably only around 10%. I don't put those in the slide. But when getting down to the statistical comparisons of whether cases or controls were different, um, uh, only about one in the 33 um, of papers uh, had those kinds of analysis so that I could say there should be a statistical adjustment for those variables uh, at the end of the study. So really quite a different uh, literature than we're used to in epidemiology and for which we would, as a reviewer or an editor, uh, bring into an epidemiology journal. But this was not anywhere as near rare as the participation rates. Now this was, this was uh, even, even uh, more parsimonious. Um, uh, about 9% had some comment about participation rates uh, in terms of how selective these populations were. Um, and in terms of comparing participants and non-participants, uh, there were literally only two papers uh, which really described uh, um, if the people who chose to participate and not. So a lot of the uh, things we look for in, uh, in the selection of cases and controls really didn't occur. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, two-thirds uh, of the case of the papers um, uh, were pre prevalent cases derived from clinical sources. Uh, about one-third were uh, population-based or incident cases, and so certainly uh, loads of opportunity for prevalence incidence bias, or which which really gets into the question of what genes you're um, you're um, uh, really studying. Uh, a number of of uh, diseases. 
and would appear to have genes which are uh, associated with prognosis, the aggressiveness of prostate cancer, uh, the, the case fatality rates of coronary of myocardial infarction. And so when you're, you're um, studying prevalent cases uh, without the ones who have died, uh, et cetera, uh, you may have a very heterogeneous phenotype to some other cases in which included those individuals. So um, some issues there uh, to talk about. Uh, let's just give you an example here of a case control study. Um, this was a study of type 2 diabetes in, in Mexican Americans. Um, uh, obviously, um, most of the uh, data um, um, have been primarily in European or European American uh, populations, uh, although many of the subsequent uh, replication and other studies uh, were in uh, uh, just a wonderful array of studies, but it certainly was good to see uh, a GWAS in type 2 diabetes in a population that we know is obviously very affected by type 2 diabetes. So 281 cases with diabetes defined by the usual technique. And then there are 280 um, controls from a random population uh, without really their diabetes uh, status ever being checked. There was no, there was no data. They weren't, obviously, um, they were just taken from a random uh, sample. And, um, uh, and just from a bank rather than, um, than really um, even questioned about this. So about over 100,000 SNPs were assayed, four genes were identified. Uh, but the real question is, in terms of misclassification here, obviously, is there should be a substantial prevalence, we think 7 to 14 percent of the type 2 diabetes in the controls, uh, just from what we know of the population. Uh, and, and so an example then, obviously, uh, as a reviewer, I would have been very worried about um, there not even being any clinical data about diabetes to say nothing about the same kinds of, of screening that we had for the cases. So just a, a kind of a, one of the, um, the issues we've identified. Now, there are several um, other um, interesting uh, biases here in the, in the collection of, uh, and again, the goal here is to find the signal for the gene, identify the gene associated with the disease. Maybe um, the magnitude of that association, the strength of that association may be a secondary consideration. Uh, sometimes. Um, and so oftentimes what you'll see uh, is the use of super cases. These would be not only a person with the disease, but additional criteria that increases the chance of a genetic etiology, a case with a positive family history, uh, or multiple uh, relatives with a family history, or an early onset. These would be classic um, super cases. In terms of super controls, the flip side use of additional criteria um, that decreases the chance of a genetic etiology, older age, a negative family history. My favorite is an older age person with multiple behavioral risk factors for that condition without the disease. Uh, again, not exactly a sample of your general population who could get the disease in terms of your case control study. The final bias to talk about would be the latent case bias, the inclusion of controls in persons who could never develop the disease even if they carried the gene. And there are some of those that are, um, for us, you know, at some point your deep down inside epidemiology gland starts to um, pump out rage hormones at some point, even though it may not make any difference. It just, I don't know, I'll show you. The, um, so here's a study of prostate cancer. Do you know my association study of prostate cancer? And this was a discovery study. The first, the first study out is called the discovery study. Um, 1,854 cases. And again, these were symptomatic, not just people uh, found. These were people who came in with obviously aggressive tumors that, that, that were in the bone or, or caused um, urologic uh, issues, not just uh, one found at... at uh, uh, screening, etc. Um, They're all diagnosed at the age of less than 60 years or had a positive family history of prostate cancer. So super cases, not a sample of all the cases that could come. Similarly, they used super controls. Again, 1,890 controls. Again, they had to be older than the age of 50 uh, and with a normal PSA. I don't have any problem with this, but the um, uh, one of the points, uh, actually it's actually a, a very low uh, PSA, uh, 
Um, but what you ended up here with is that actually this uh, group of cases being substantially younger uh, than this group of controls, in addition to the other super case definitions. So they had about a half million um, SNPs uh, assayed. They found 11 new SNPs, SNPs associated 10 to the minus 6th, and then went into a replication study uh, with uh, 3,300 cases controls, which were much more generally um, defined. Your typical case of of prostate cancer, your typical control. They genotyped these 11 STIPs. They found seven to be independently associated uh, at the 10 to the minus seventh. Well, here's what they found. And if you look down your odds ratios, the ones that are positively associated with prostate cancer in the discovery study, in every instance, went toward the null, okay? Um, in those which were negatively associated, again, migrated toward the null. Now, I will give credit to the authors here. They acknowledged the use of the super cases and said that in future studies, the real estimate of risk should be these. That was in the text and as is appropriately to do. You don't always see that. Um, but you can see the, 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 the issue here of obviously uh, putting out the net, um, finding some genes, and then following it up uh, with these, these studies uh, in replication. Um, uh, the danger comes in, of course, is that when we make our risk estimates with these as really having a population relevance rather than the unique characteristic that they had. Um, whereas these are probably the population. And as I'll mention later, the winner's curse uh, is when you do your study here, uh, find these, and either have regression to the mean, or even worse, uh, a, an exaggerated um, uh, estimate of risk, and then detect, uh, then use this for your sample size calculations for your sub subsequent studies, or other investigators using those odds ratios for sample size calculations in which they can't uh, replicate these. It has to do with the super case and super control bias. Uh, and this is this issue of the, the latent cases, um, and uh, here is a discovery um, study in Iceland, um, 1,890 uh, uh, cases of prostate cancer uh, and over 20,000 controls. The problem is, is that 60,000, 60 percent of the controls um, didn't have a prostate or I don't think so. I don't know everything about Iceland, but I would assume that the women don't have prostates. So that even if they had the gene, they couldn't express it. So in, in terms of your minor allele frequency of your cases and your controls, if 60% of your, your controls uh, really weren't at risk, it's going to minimize those differences in minor allele frequencies, okay? It's going to bring them to the, the null. Um, these were then replicated in this huge number. This is Rochester, Minnesota. Um, uh, but you can see that in this, um, uh, uh, you know, huge numbers of cases, uh, huge numbers of controls, and certainly some of them uh, were women. Um, a couple of points here. I think in terms of these latent cases, it turns out that, that these have been uh, amazingly robust in terms of finding associations uh, and doesn't seem to have made a, a, a big impact. Um, um, this is probably has to do with the fact that, um, that the, um, uh, the, the prevalence of some of the, the prevalence of disease is, is um, uh, I'm sorry, the prevalence of the gene is relatively small uh, and the, uh, the difference in mean allele frequency is relatively uh, small um, um, so that you can, um, if the prevalence of the disease in the population um, uh, would have uh, of added to, uh, would have been in the, um, in the males, I'm not explaining this particularly well, but the 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 prevalence of the of the susceptibility gene in the in the males um, um, wasn't uh, that much different from the females, given 
the fact that of the low prevalence of disease uh, occurring uh, in, in in the men. So, um, but but still, I think later on these are going to be issues that we're going to have to deal with, particularly if we're going to start looking at gene environment uh, interactions, et cetera. Um, and I, I honestly don't understand why the investigators, it's not like they didn't have just male controls. I mean, I mean, it's not like they didn't have them. Maybe if there were only women and these, all the men had prostate cancer, maybe I could see that. But, but uh, so they really didn't ever just analyze these, although some of the papers do describe analysis uh, with or without um, uh, the women and, um, and um, um, saying that it didn't make much difference. Uh, you also find uh, similar analyses of um, cases of breast cancer um, with substantial number of the controls being men. That's a little bit harder issue since men can get breast cancer, not, not frequently, but they can. But so this is a, a, a situation of latent case bias and something we need, need to uh, ponder uh, its use. Um, a few other selection biases. There's, of course, membership bias. Membership in a group may imply a degree of health which differs systematically from the truth. Um, perhaps a kind of, of membership bias, and certainly a, a confounding, is this population stratification that Terry uh, has introduced. I'm going to say a little bit more about uh, and then there's this uh, phenotypic variation bias in which you'll have multiple um, replication studies, uh, all of them using potentially uh, different definitions of the disease, um, obviously setting you up for the possibility of, a, of differences in the uh, assessment of risk. Uh, so here's the, uh, the Wellcome Trust uh, Case Control Consortium. Uh, this used, um, uh, this has been alluded to several times. This um, took a half a million um, SNPs. Um, and the design of the study used 2,000 persons from each of seven diseases. They, they targeted seven diseases. And their controls were 3,000 persons without any disease, 1,500 in the 1958 British birth cohort, which is a, a population cohort study, obviously all of the, the same age. Uh, and then uh, 1,500 uh, blood donors from the UK Blood Service. So obviously setting one up for a membership bias, an individual who goes in to donate blood, at least in our hospital, is really quite different than a random uh, sample of the population. And there's, there have been, uh, as Terry had mentioned, a lot of concern about us just detecting genes associated with blood donation. Um, and so, um, uh, now, having said that, it's also in this, um, this analysis, uh, sometimes there'll be the 3,000 controls used. Sometimes um, they'll use the 2,000 uh, cases um, with, uh, say, one of these disorders, uh, and the other um, 12,000 cases will go into the control group with the 3,000 as control controls. So they weren't uh, random samples of the population uh, either. So a number of these that caused the classically trained epidemiologists, uh, at least this classically trained epidemiologist, to wrinkle one's brow. Uh, but the, I'd have to say, with the Wellcome Trust being a very successful in identifying uh, a number of gene associations, uh, would appear to be uh, amazingly robust, um, but still um, issues of concern. So I just want to uh, uh, give another example or so of this population stratification. Um, uh, just to say that um, that uh, these different allele frequencies um, uh, due to the diversity of population of origins and unrelated is it, really a confounding. Um, there have to be differences in the disease prevalence between populations. Uh, there have to be differences in allele of frequencies. And therefore, with different admixtures, you'll have your classic confounding uh, triad. And so what you have here is coming out of the, of the, uh, of the womb of uh, mankind in Africa here, uh, and then spreading across, uh, you have obviously um, most of the genes are shared, but Europeans having some separate ones, and East Asians others, and Africans one. And so the degree to which you're admixed around here could lead to a situation in which uh, a gene in a disease which is, say, more f frequent in Africans um, in an admixed um, uh, 
a disease which is more um, frequent in Africans could be associated with genes which um, are more frequent in Africans, not on a causal basis, but on this population stratification basis. Uh, and um, the classic example of this is from um, Bill Noller uh, reported uh, here in this Lancet paper uh, looking at um, Native Americans. Um, and uh, there is this, this, um, this uh, diabetes uh, gene. Um, it had a prevalence of 1% uh, in, um, in um, African Americans and obviously uh, 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 in, uh, Native Americans. And obviously, diabetes prevalence is very high in this population. Uh, and then you have this uh, polymorphism, which is very frequent in Caucasian Americans, and obviously um, a lower prevalence of diabetes. And when you put them all together um, into a, a study um, of, say, a, um, a, a Native American population, uh, you end up with this kind of a, a two by two table uh, showing uh, the um, uh, protective uh, suggestion of protection uh, of this uh, of this uh, genotype here um, with those with positive uh, obviously um, uh, having a very uh, relatively little diabetes compared to um, um, not with diabetes uh, and vice versa. Then what you could do is, is uh, stratify essentially by this index of Indian heritage, similar to what we would do in, in the next slide describing a uh, large uh, um, number of SNPs that classify um, population stratification. Here, just w one index of Indian heritage stratifying by from low to high. Um, and then uh, looking at the association across these strata, and you can see very little association once the stratification. So clearly, this association was confounded by, um, by the degree of, of uh, American Indian heritage, which, when taken into account, showed no association with the, with the, uh, with the disease. So um, probably the, uh, the classic uh, description of population stratification. Now, what one can do is then use unlinked genetic markers uh, for this. Uh, the, um, the, um, obviously, the, the population stratification allows many marker allele frequencies to vary between um, population segments. Um, any disease more prevalent in one subpopulation will be associated with, with any alleles and high frequency in that subpopulation when you look at the whole. So this is the whole issue of population stratification. But however, you can also use these multiple markers um, by analyzing these unli unlinked markers um, and essentially adjusting for them. So uh, what um, Sladek did in uh, this study uh, in France, this was just a study within the country of France. Uh, it was looking at type 2 diabetes, 660 cases, 614 controls. Um, upwards of uh, 400,000 SNPs. Um, and uh, this, this, um, this SNP, um, um, 200 kilobases from a lactase gene on chromosome 2 uh, was one of the associated. Um, it was strongly associated with type 2 diabetes, but it also was known to have a strong north-south prevalence within the country of France alone. Now, we're not talking about Asia versus North America or, or you know, big differences. We're actually talking about within the country of France. Um, what they used then was adjusted for 20,000 plus SNPs that were not related to type 2 diabetes as a measure of the population stratification of the genetic heterogeneity across north to south France. And after adjustment for the stratification, most of the association was removed. So again, another measure about um, how this uh, could be important. Uh, lactase, um, you might uh, think, should be uh, associated north-south. Uh, the milk drinkers in the north and the wine drinkers in the south of France um, obviously you could see how that, uh, that could work on a genetic basis. Uh, phenotypic uh, variation bias um, uh, uh, obviously is also an issue. Here is a, um, a description of cases in a study of atrial fibrillation. Uh, the first sample, 
um, you had uh, hospitalized patients um, with atrial fibrillation. The second sample, you had hospitalized patients uh, with hospitalized with ischemic stroke or TIA um, with atrial fibrillation. The third one was hospitalized patients again with acute stroke. And the fourth sample was, um, was lone atrial fibrillation in patients with hypertension. So what you have is, is all sorts of other things. And um, I should think if you study this compared to this, I would imagine you'd come up with some genes that were associated with stroke here with hypertension. Uh, obviously, this heterogeneity of the definition of the phenotype uh, leads to uh, possibilities of, um, uh, of uh, heterogeneity. Um, we've talked a little bit about um, uh, genotyping quality bias. Um, uh, just to point out is, is that uh, a number of papers did really lack the genotyping control and really the quality control um, the criteria that were used um, or what we call the, the call rate, the success rate. Um, we've also, um, a number of papers did not test for Hardy-Weinberg disequilibrium as a measure of quality control. Um, and um, there were a number of examples of uh, transmission disequilibrium um, testing uh, bias. Um, uh, some of them, I think, um, caught and some not. But uh, some distortion of the frequencies um, um, at the end of that time. Uh, one of the other questions is, uh, is DNA collected and handled uh, identically in cases and controls? Uh, this was uh, from Clayton and uh, this type 1 um, diabetes study, um, uh, the, the GRID study, uh, 1958 uh, uh, British birth court um, um, looking at, um, uh, at the controls and uh, examining um, a small number of SNPs here, looking at the lymphoblastoid cell lines um, uh, using the same protocol. Uh, but um, done at a couple of different uh, laboratories is the point of this slide. Uh, and despite uh, um, randomly ordering them and masking them as case control status, uh, there were a number of extreme associations who really couldn't be repeated with a second genotyping, um, probably having to do with, um, with uh, different uh, laboratory techniques. Um, in terms of um, environmental exposure uh, bias, information bias, uh, frequently what we saw was a lack of collection or presentation of known environmental causes of disease or comparison between cases and controls. Um, these occurred uh, very frequently. Again, this had to do with this table one that was frequently missing um, and um, didn't really allow the reader to really judge whether or not there should have been a further um, uh, adjustment or not. Uh, just Further with this, the confounding control bias was the lack of statistical adjustment or stratified analysis in the presence of potential confounding. And so even though there was um, were large differences identified uh, frequently, there was no statistical uh, test then to follow through and adjust for them. Um, the, um, so there were few comparisons of these exposures um, between cases and controls. Um, in only about 36%, again, there were these tables comparing the cases and controls um, in, in terms of, of what um, important risk factors were known. Um, again, the statistical comparison then was, uh, was really only in about 3.5%. The statistical adjustment was only in about one out of six, uh, and only about one out of, uh, of six were stratified by analysis by a potential confounder. So in terms of the things we'd like to see perhaps in the analysis uh, side of things or, or using the, uh, collecting the information, displaying it so we can make a judgment and then mathematically taking into account some of these differences, obviously um, uh, an area where um, uh, we, we think the analysis could have been better. Now this is a study on uh, macular degeneration um, and um, uh, this study was from uh, Hong Kong, uh, but just to point out that um, this did have a table one looking at cases controls. I believe it was in the um, in, in a um, supplement, um, and these are all risk factors for macular degeneration. 
male sex, age, and being a smoker. And so before the gene analysis was done, um, this is the prevalence of men versus women in the, in the cases controls here. Obviously, beginning with um, great differences and the prevalence of smokers was also tremendously great. I guess what I was trying to figure out from this paper is how they just didn't identify the genes related to smoking or perhaps uh, male sex. It would have been much better to have tried to stratify and, and uh, there was a one phrase in this paper saying that they adjusted for things and they still found these genes. Dro drove me a little crazy. Um, and, um, and just to say is, is that uh, I think the study uh, to really try to look for the genes um, could have been um, much better done in which um, these known risk factors um, were, were balanced in the two groups, so you could really look at the gene effects. Uh, confounding, I think you're all very uh, familiar with, um, um, and we won't, uh, we won't talk about that. Obviously, you need something ex associated with exposure um, uh, and associated with disease uh, and not an intermediate step, so here you have your your illustration of confounding, the confounder related to exposure and disease, uh, and not just um, part of the causal pathway, which we see very frequently in, um, in, uh, in epidemiology, uh, and certainly um, uh, I'll show you an example of, uh, uh, of, uh, of this kind of uh, confounding. So <clears throat> here is a um, uh, a study looking at this particular gene, the FTO gene, um, and type 2 diabetes. Uh, and here's your welcome trust, uh, and you had two studies, each of which showed a statistically highly significant odds ratio between the FTO gene variants uh, and diabetes. A third study did not, just downright zero. And we'll tell you that this study selected patients in a very, um, uh, a very different uh, way, um, particularly related to body weight. Uh, well, um, as it further goes along, um, we can look at the, uh, the variants, uh, the TTAT and AA variants um, of FTO uh, in the case of controls and show that these uh, obviously um, uh, the case control groups for diabetes were obviously very different in their body weights, uh, and there was also um, um, this um, uh, this difference in uh, gene frequency. Uh, these are the BM these are the BMIs. There was also this uh, this difference in, uh, in in gene frequency and subsequent analyses. I believe it was by Zagini. Um, uh, in which this adjustment was done, uh, obviously um, um, showed that the FTO gene is a better predictor of BMI than it is of diabetes, which is shown here. So here is the first part of the slide um, showing that the FTO gene uh, was uh, related to, um, to um, uh, BMI, and then when adjusting for BMI, looking at the association between the FTO gene uh, and diabetes, uh, these associations disappeared. So clearly what you had was the FTO diabetes association confounded uh, by both of their, rela its relationship to both um, obesity, um, by, its, by its relationship to um, uh, obesity and um, and BMI. So um, uh, I guess the point there is, is that we think of confounding in terms of behaviors and in uh, uh, and, uh, and some things that can also occur relative to genes, the, the rules of confounding, that the confounders related to both exposure uh, and to, um, and to um, disease uh, still hold, and um, we need to look out for those as we look at our um, multi, um, as I look at our, our gene disease relationships. I think you're all familiar with, uh, with uh, dealing with uh, confounders. Um, 
Uh, just to say is, is that we don't have many genome-wide association studies um, with randomization. There have been a number of uh, ones with restrictions. I think Terry had mentioned the one with APOE in which only APOE positive individuals were, were identified and then the genes, so this was restricted to one group. Um, uh, uh, not a lot of matching going on in terms of selecting cases controls, although that Dewan study would have been a very good one. It's a relatively small study, would have been a very good um, study to match cases and controls. Again, in the analysis, we're frequently missing um, uh, certainly um, uh, standardization for age and gender, um, uh, perhaps not as big of an issue in genome-wide studies. Um, uh, in terms of stratification, uh, sampling into subsamples according to criteria such as a genome, um, one of the very good studies on Crohn's disease, for example, um, stratified by Jewish and non-Jewish, um, which could have very much provided a population stratification kind of, um, kind of issue, and the authors there um, with the higher prevalence in Ashkenazi Jewish populations stratified by uh, that population did separate analyses, and uh, uh, I thought that was, um, was very well indicated and obviously added a lot to the study. And then multivariate analyses, again, frequently are not done or certainly were not shown the analyses, frequently saying multivariate adjustment showed no difference, were really um, often not, not shown um, this uh, handling of the, uh, the compounding. Finally, um, just a little bit about the, uh, the analysis and uh, presentation of data. Uh, obviously, the alpha uh, error control bias, uh, uh, Terry talked about the Bonferroni corrections, et cetera. There still are a few papers, particularly smaller studies, um, even though using a large number of uh, SNPs, et cetera, which uh, are not controlling at this level. Um, the data dredging bias uh, uh, is an interesting one from uh, Sackett. It's the lack of replication studies testing hypotheses uh, identified in the discovery study is our definition of it. Uh, in other words, you would go and do your big study, find something, and uh, leave it alone. And, and obviously, um, Terry's talk uh, next uh, after the break, uh, we're going to talk about really the requirement for replication studies. Um, to get away from this bias. And then finally, the winner's curse I've already alluded to. That's the overestimation of the effect size in the discovery GWAS and then inability to replicate um, uh, the odds ratios because of lack of power. This is both a censuring, kind of a regression to the uh, mean uh, issue, um, as well as possibly the super case and super control issues. Um, but um, it, it does talk about the, the first one out of the box that first uh, fly landing on the, um, on the whale uh, oftentimes um, uh, hasn't had replication success uh, because of uh, this effect. Uh, and I showed you, um, I showed you this uh, eel study again. Um, so if, if they tried to replicate this, it would be uh, tough sledding. Finally, let's talk about the biases as interpretation. In reading this literature, you really get the idea that you're flying along and saying, what's a mountain goat doing way up here in the cloud bank? You have an idea that something should be happening, and when something doesn't happen, um, you kind of discount it. Uh, the fact that he's about to run into a mountain uh, is probably not part of his hypothesis list, um, even though obviously it should be. Um, uh, and these were uh, reviewed, these interpretation biases um, in this general review by Kapchuk. Uh, I think some of them that uh, are to think about the confirmation bias, evaluating evidence that supports one's preconceptions differently from evidence that challenges these convictions. For example, this whole idea of gene deserts, the initial GWAS study, oh, it's in a gene desert, it can't occur. That's really a conviction bias. You had to have a gene in an exon changing a protein for this to work. Um, and only until later when a number of these kept on coming up and within the same study you had some introns and some exons and some regulatories and gene deserts and all, uh, I think we got away from um, the preconception uh, of this gene protein requirement. Uh, there's the rescue bias you still see in the discussion, discounting data by finding selected faults in the experiments and uh, a lot of discussion here, or mechanism bias uh, an interesting discussion is, is 
is the investigators, and Terry's going to get into this in the, her next talk on functional studies, looking further and further away from where the STIP was, looking for any kind of mechanism that would, and despite the lack of hypothesis generation um, in GWAS study, there's still, you end up with saying, well, if we find something, um, um, uh, we better find um, some underlying mechanism, uh, even though the preconceptions of the whole GWAS study is agnostic. So, um, and some um, little um, things to, to think about. So, um, uh, Terry's going to talk about re replicating, um, um, and um, in that paper um, that I'd uh, highly recommend, uh, I put in your handout all those things that we would recommend in terms of minimizing bias. I'm not going to go through them because it's EPI 101, but just to say, um, many of these issues, if that Chanak and Manolio paper were followed, uh, uh, we would um, have probably less heterogeneity uh, in the studies. Okay, um, I think those are all uh, in there. So, um, what we want to do is, is that um, when we find something, yep, it's a mammoth, um, what we'd like to do is, is be able to say, um, we have uh, an association, uh, and it was not a spurious one, not due to something we can't account for, but rather uh, uh, something that we can do uh, confirmatory studies, mechanistic studies, drug target studies, uh, obviously, uh, and this deals with the information going into that decision um, being credible. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. When you mentioned about the super case bias, I think uh, sometimes how to view balance between a super con uh, super case bias and the true case recruitment. Because sometimes if we try to recruit a true or a extreme case, just want to ensure they are true cases. So how do you get balance between these two issues? I think there is a way to get balance. In other words, the the stringently enforced preset criteria to select cases rel uh, uh, representative of all the cases in the population is doable. The super case bias comes in is that when we put in additional criteria which maximizes the chance that this is a familial form of that. And then the bias comes in, is so when we take the odds ratio associated with that kind of case, we, says, we say it applies to everybody. But I don't think that should keep us from, if we want to really identify a representative case, that has to do with setting down phenotypic definitions um, that really cover all cases in the population. If we do want to use super cases so that we would put out a, um, a, a particular specific net, if you will, uh, to maximize uh, the odds ratio so we can detect them within the sample size we have, I actually don't think that's a problem. And I think Ely's uh, is quite an attractive paper because in that paper, again, with the replication study, then they did it in a more representative one in the smaller number of SNPs that they identified the first time and then say these are the odds ratios that we think are representative, uh, uh, really are the, the strength of the association uh, that we found. But sometimes I think there are case, super cases and super controls um, and um, sometimes they're used uh, throughout in, in, uh, in replication studies as well. Uh, sometimes they're blended in all the, the data is analyzed together, and, and so I think you will have that inflation of odds ratios sometimes because of the use of super cases and, and super controls. I hope that answers your question. Um, so I, I just wonder whether you, can, you could give us some um, guidance um, for the epidemiologists when we look forward, I would like to design a GWA study in the future. If, um, obvious, 
to avoid and or to minimize all the potential confoundings, stuff like the both uh, you and Terry talked about um, replication extremely important. I just wonder whether you have any ballpark uh, suggestion regarding for the initial uh, GWA study, what is the minimum sample size in terms of case control we are looking for? Because that is obviously the, the more the better, but what's the minimum considered acceptable? And then what is the minimum sample size would be ideal for um, at least consider adequate for the replication stage and how we balance these two stages. Well, I, I, I will bet the mortgage that uh, Dr. Manolio has some comments on this. Um, but um, this is really the interesting issue when you come up with an agnostic study design. There are no preconceptions. You have a half a million uh, little, little markers and you have no prior hypothesis as to how they relate to the disease, up or down. Um, therefore, your effect size uh, and, and the whole sample size calculation obviously is, uh, is, is, uh, is, is problematic. Um, so, so I think that's, that's one of the issues is that the usual the prevalence estimates we go and look at, et cetera, when you really don't know what the prevalence of the major or minor alleles are going to be or the, the difference between them is going to be, um, obviously a quite different. You could uh, say we want to identify an odds ratio of a certain level, I guess, and, and do it that way. But um, I think what the rule of thumb has been has been kind of a thousand cases and a thousand controls. But I think that is uh, just kind of right out of the ether. Uh, and, uh, um, and clearly, if you look at the, um, one of the other issues with many of these diseases, like for example, macular degeneration, uh, some of these diseases you can't uh, marshal uh, thousands and thousands of them. Some of them are quite uh, unusual diseases, so you're going to be left with, uh, you know, 200 cases and uh, and a thousand controls, etc. So, um, so I'm, I'm pulling up a slide here, so keep talking. Okay. Uh, so I think there's some uh, issues there as well, but it's clearly the literature uh, has uh, quite a number of studies with 200 or uh, some of them. You get very nervous when they're down to the 50 or uh, or so. Um, um, there you go. So, yeah, so, so this was a, a very nice question that was addressed by the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium. If, if you only read one paper in Genome-wide Association, don't read Tom's and mine, don't, don't read Chanix and mine, read the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium. It's a little long. Um, yeah, it is, it is big, but it's, it's absolutely brilliant. Very, very clearly explained, um, especially the supplementary methods. But one of the nifty things that they did was they said, okay, um, with the sample sizes that we had in, in our study, what kind of power would we have had to detect the associations that we found if we actually went with smaller sample sizes? And so along the x-axis, you can see here, you know, what would the, the power be? These are the, the various associations that they found in their, in their studies. And they, they basically looked at, you know, if they had 500 cases and 500 controls, they would only have found, actually, these are two that are superimposed, so they would have found two of the 20 some that they actually found. Um, with 1,000 cases and controls, I think it was about nine or so. Uh, sorry, certain, certain of them would be, uh, would be two. Um, here at 1,000, I think this one, they, they only had 40% um, uh, power to, to pick up the two. But here they would be certain to pick up two, um, and expected might be about six if you go with an 80% um, power, but even in this range here. Um, and then uh, if, they, if they went with 1,500 controls, expected, whoops, expected about nine. So, so they came up with some, some very nice estimates of, of these, you know, being relatively modest odds ratios in the 1.3 range. The, the vast consensus as it is in any study is the more the better. Um, and one big debate was would you be better off with more, more people or more SNPs? Um, and the Wellcome Trust Group also sort of showed that, that really you're better off with more people. Um, you get more information from that than with more SNPs. So sorry to, to leap in with that, but I thought oh, it was, I, it seemed timely. I, I thought you had that question. <laughs> uh, one more question about Korean studies. Uh, uh, in Korea, there are two kinds of uh, genomic studies uh, from government funds. And one is the 
population study uh, I said yesterday. And another one is the uh, hospital-based uh, uh, genome-wide study. And the key idea of the two kinds of the different types are uh, providing cases from hospital-based study and um, uh, collecting some uh, controls from the population-based study. But uh, we have some protocol to standardize the exposure measurement uh, among the population study, but there is no, no standardization between the population study and the hospital study. So is there any way or, uh, to overcome the, our limitation to different measurement for doing some case control study? Well, I think there's a, a number of issues there. Number one, with your population controls, obviously you do want, depending on what disease you're studying, you want to make sure there's no contamination with cases. So, for example, if um, if you're you're doing a case control study of hospitalizations, hospitalized patients with coronary disease, you would want to make sure that 10 percent of your your population controls really hadn't carried that diagnosis. There will be some, obviously, silent cases, as we all know, but um, obviously um, one of the other uh, issues uh, is, um, the second issue, obviously, is the genotyping. You'll still see something that one population will have used one platform or one method of handling and another one would have used another. The, the platforms are getting better and oftentimes those studies will, will take 20 and do them by both and show the concordance. I think you, you showed it on a slide. So that's getting better. Um, perhaps more of an issue would have to do with, with the processing of those samples. If you see a very low call rate, for example, in your, your population control, and a very high call rate, it's a, obviously an opportunity for genotyping uh, errors in which uh, you're going to show differences between case control studies, not because of the association for the gene, but because of how they were which genes were missing because of, or under, under assessed because of the, of the genotyping quality. The third has to do, at, which is a, oftentimes a, a, a problem, uh, are these other uh, behavior, behavioral and environmental uh, issues that you'd like to um, use for, um, for uh, adjustment, uh, if not interaction. Uh, tobacco smoking, for example, would be a, a good example. Um, and it would be very nice if you could standardize the behavior collection between your, essentially use the same questionnaire used in your population with those of your hospitalized uh, cases. Those, and frequently that's not, not done. For example, I think the, um, uh, the GWA study of Mexican Americans uh, with diabetes, uh, obviously that was a clinical uh, group of cases from a, a diabetes clinic and a, and a population study, uh, which was kind of just a general roster which didn't have the testing for diabetes. So you had a variety of, of uh, different informations and the possibility of information bias sneaking in there. So I, the, the, rec the recommendation in, in the Korean study would be to see if, if one could uh, standardize the uh, the uh, information in the um, that you're using in the population study with the uh, with the institutional data. No, I think we, we're we're about to take a break, aren't we? Uh, I guess the other side to the the sample size question is is effect size. Um, you know, I'm, in the Ely study, I'm I'm seeing seeing in the replications these really small effect sizes and. You know, how, how am I supposed to think about those if uh, sort of you know, these additive genes playing with each other, but the, the effect sizes are so small, I'm just not impressed. And uh, you know, what, what <laughs> so can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Um, I'm going to comment then on that in my last talk, okay. um, which has to do with applications. But that does, you know, I mean, what did you learn in your first? 15 minutes of your case control lecture, you know, obviously is, 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 is odds ratios and the size, and we really have to be concerned about odds ratios less than two as being um, due to confounding and, and a variety of others, and, and I'm sure you learned that the same way I learned that. Um, and so this is a bit of a paradigm shift 
Um, and so what I'm going to comment on in mine is the consideration of, of the fact that what we might have done is, is uh, chopped up genetic risk into all these little SNPs and a variety of them. We're not really talking about all the genetic risk because when we try to adjust and, and account for the heritability, which we learned about yesterday, um, or the uh, familial risk, like in a, the risk associated with a variable positive family history, we come up with quite small proportions of those accounted for mathematically. And this is kind of, you're, you're, you're thinking now, well, then you get what you deserve because an odd ratio of 1.3 probably isn't going to account for very much, unless it, even if it's very prevalent. And the, um, the point is, is that how many of those odds ratios of 1.3 variants are out there? Because we're only measuring kind of clusters. Of and how them. do you sum those up, right? Exactly. And, and there have papers have been tried, and I don't know, Terry, if you want to comment on the extent to which, but it's, it's, um, it gets at this question that I was beginning to ask, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my last talk, is when are you done? When have you found all of the, the culprits? And I don't think we have a gold standard for, for doing that, um, because um, the, we're, we're not into copy number variants, we're not into these regulatory things. There's even on, a, on, a, on just the gene structure basis, there's so much more out there. So until we can show that we've accounted for all the heritability, uh, I think we're going to be left with, uh, with odds ratios of uh, 1.3. Well, and I think it's important to recognize, too, that the, the small odds ratios used to make us very nervous in epidemiology because of uncontrolled confounding and measurement bias. And, and the measurements here, as long as you get rid of the genotyping error that you can pretty much control, um, are really pretty good. And so, so the 1.2s and 1.15s and that are probably believable. The, the meaning of them is, is a big issue, and Tom will go into that some, recognizing that some of these may be pointing the way toward drug targets that might work for everybody. So, so you know, um, familial hypercholesterol cholesterolemia was a very, very rare gene. It, you probably couldn't even pick it up in a genome-wide association study for, for cholesterol levels. And yet the drug works for everyone except, ironically, the people who are homozygous for the variant or who don't have the receptors for the drug to, to work on. The, another thing to think about is, is that as we do in more and more and more of these studies, um, the Wellcome Trust Group, again, Peter Donnelly, has, has come up with some estimates of how many variants might there be out there that actually due to, to variation and, and distance from the, the particular, you know, the, the actual causative SNP on the platform, you're actually underestimating the, the risk of. So because you're a little ways away from it, there might be a 1.5 or a 2.0 or even a 4.0 hiding there. And if you do this for 100 diseases, probably everybody is at risk for something. You know, we're all going to die of something, um, except me. Um, and, and, you know, the, the diseases that we might be at risk for, you can, you can actually sort of estimate gee, you know, you'll find 90% of the, of the population will be at risk for at least one of these based on their genetic variants. And if you could find that, that would be very useful and, and perhaps, you know, do some, some interventions on them. So when you take them one at a time, you really have to think genomically, you know, and, and one at a time, maybe not, but together, probably. And we haven't even touched the subject of gene-gene interaction and gene-environment interaction, which is another part of the, the whole. Maybe just well, we're, before we're breaking, maybe ask the editors in, in the group if, if we could have some editorial comment um, uh, about this issue of um, new genre, new technologies, etc. A lot of excitement. Um, it deserves to be the scientific breakthrough um, of the year as it has been for a while. Uh, on the other hand, um, it, it's, it's, it's kind of, um, of like getting a, a a new sports car and then forgetting about the rules of driving safely. Um, so, Linda or? So I, I was going to ask you um, <laughs> I, I this is how to handle this because, um, I mean, being an editor of a general medicine journal, the ones that we get are most likely the ones that have been rejected by, you know, the genetics journals. So, um, you know, we're, we're aware of that. Um, 
I'd like to sort of have a checklist that says, you know, put it back on the authors because finding reviewers who actually understand genetic epide epidemiology well enough to be able to interpret the papers is difficult. Um, and I mean, I think this is an area where there's, you know, you can probably think of 10 people off the top of your head who could review these papers and they're all reviewing all of them and they're busy and, you know, they're going to say, I mean, most likely thing is they're going to say, I already reviewed this for another journal and didn't like it. Um, and maybe, I mean, the question is, for me, a lot of the times, do I want to be, uh, you know, the first fly on the, on the whale anyway? Uh, if, if they're sending it to a general medicine journal and that's where they think it belongs, it's probably bad. Um, so I, I don't know. It's an area that I'm definitely struggling with. Um, uh, you, you also wonder if, if it's a good idea to be, uh, you know, down the food chain and be the one publishing the negative studies all the time. Uh, you know, how many of those are going to get cited, um, et cetera. So it, I find that it, it's just a complicated area. And as you were giving your talk, um, I was wondering if you could imagine having a checklist for the authors. You know, does your paper qualify this way, this way, this way? And if they don't, you just reject it without even reading the paper. Um, we, we had a talk last week that was kind of interesting that showed that same paper that you did that, um, what's it called, most uh, published research uh, findings false. Are, are false. United yeah. yeah. So the speaker there had an interesting suggestion is that maybe review should be two-phase. So the first phase would be just look at the introduction and the methods. And if you're not satisfied with the introduction and the methods, just reject it and don't even look at the data. And it, that might actually be good because then you would be more, even more agnostic to the, um, to the finding, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking about whether we could actually do that as an experiment. <laughs> uh, you know, anyway. Linda. All right, well, um, I was actually hesitating to talk about the food chain. You know, that is the nature of what we deal with every day. Um, and just the enormity of what you're telling us in terms of something like sensitivity of diet and, you know, the slides that you showed, Terry, in regard to just dietary fat and its relationship to HDL, you know, the implications for that are just enormous. <laughs> Um, and in this mindset of designer diet, and I must admit, I sort of skipped to the end to see if you were going to go back and deal with some of this, and it looks like you are, like you are so that's why I didn't ask the question. But um, I would agree with you, Phil, that, you know, um, first and foremost, I think in terms of methodologic issues, you know, to ding a paper, so to speak, up front before you even get into it, I think that really is the only way to do this in an efficient way manner. We just sort of try to do that already in terms of just the open gatekeeping that we do in terms of a paper. But, you know, as I say, in, in terms of our authorship and what people are writing about, again, you know, if, if we don't even get at some of these issues related to genetic variation in terms of ability to respond to a dietary intervention, I don't even know how to begin to, you know, address those kinds of questions, really. And I don't know if we're there yet. I mean, on the basis of what you're describing, you know, do we have a public health model? I mean, I, you know, from what I know about nutrition, I know there are certain things we can say are good for everyone, you know. But in terms of things that would be better for people who also have these genetic, um, genetically, you know, um, deviated approach, you know, responses to certain dietary interventions, interventions. I mean, that's where we want to go, but I know I don't see how we're going to get there anytime soon. So. Yeah, yeah I, I would just have a, a couple of comments. Number one is, is that um, that was to some extent the, um, the backdrop to the, the paper, uh, How to Interpret Genome-Wide Association Studies. That was essentially this issue because um, 
it wasn't clear, uh, the readers, to say nothing about the reviewers, to say nothing about the editors, um, and that was kind of the thrust, and we were pleased that, um, that the JAMA leadership um, um, appreciated that issue as well. Uh, the second is that's what this course is about, because the only way we're going to get enough reviewers, particularly, say, reviewers with the content experts in diabetes or in Crohn's disease or, or whatever, getting them up to speed in the whole genomic issues obviously starts to marry the two sides of the things that we want so they can be a competent reviewer because there's all that disease content stuff that I would have to say is given oftentimes kind of short shrift that any old case will do and kind of uh, idea. So I think, um, I think uh, that's a, a, a very important uh, part of this. And I think the third point I would have is uh, to encourage epidemiologists to get even more involved in the design and conduct of some of these, these studies as a, as a co-investigator. So they can sort of say, well, if you, put that as a, if you don't put that disease criteria on as an inclusion or exclusion criteria, you know, you're going to have all kinds of problems later. And, and this is what your input in oftentimes will not be added earlier. So I, I think those are some of the messages from, from this. Terry? Big opportunities here for, for epidemiology is, is actually to take the, you know, skim the, the genome-wide associations. We, we have them listed in our catalog and, and test them in your cohorts and then see where you have really good dietary measures. What are the interactions? What are the differences in the way people, people respond? I mean, that's work that's just begging to be done, and, and we can do it.